As many of you may know, the use of the sustain pedal in music written before 1820, 1830 is considered by some, you know who you are, to be a filthy heathen practice. One that arose largely from the availability of the thing in the first place, the fact that over time, more and more people from all walks of life had access to and were able to learn to play the piano. And finally, that most of the time, very few of us humans actually give a crap about being judicious about anything, much less how and when to use the sustain pedal when playing the piano. It's there, it makes certain things easier, and can make the instrument sound really big and beautiful at times. And I, a filthy heathen, but one who strives to make informed musical choices at a rate of about 20% of the time, recently went skulking around the syringe-strewn alleys of the internet to find the date or date range of approximately when sustain or damper pedals started to become standard features on pianos. And the answer to that particular question is that damper control mechanisms in pianos, or rather the piano's predecessor, the piano forte, were introduced in Germany around 1760. Except that rather than a pedal mechanism, it was controlled by a bar under the keyboard that players would trigger with their knees. The migration of the control mechanism to a more gravity-friendly pedal appeared not long after that in 1777, when a maker in London by the name of Adam Beyer introduced a piano with a split or cleft damper control. One pedal controlled all of the keys, all of the notes from middle C and above, and another pedal controlled all of the notes below middle C. Which to me sounds like a pretty great feature, actually, and makes me think of the current all-or-nothing mechanism, which became the standard around 1830, as a regression rather than an enhancement on the original. But anyway, that's not actually what I wanted to talk about today. I have a complicated relationship with the sustain pedal, and we're just going to have to continue working it out on our own. Thanks for your concern, though. No, actually, what I wanted to say is that, whilst in the process of gleaning the above information on the damper pedal, I stumbled across a fascinating article written by a Mr. Fred Schaefer Sturm, of the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque on the sostenuto pedal, also known as the rarely used middle pedal that, despite the fact that it's rarely, if ever used, is somehow a standard feature on most pianos today. I was able to reach Mr. Sturm, who has kindly consented to allow me to use his article in this video. Thank you very much. And the link to his article and others he's published is in the description below. So before today, I can confidently tell you that I have depressed the sostenuto pedal on this piano with my foot probably less than 10 times total. And yet, funnily enough, I remember the nice Steinway salesperson lady really taking pains to emphasize it. Oh, you know, it has a real sostenuto pedal. And I was like, does it now? Our apartment broker did the same kind of lean-in for special emphasis move with the wine refrigerator in the apartment's kitchen. Like, oh, and of course, the wine refrigerator thingy for a pair of discerning gentlemen like yourselves. Meanwhile, we drink Budweiser, or whatever's on sale at the time, and as for the wine refrigerator thingy, like, we use it to store sheet pans and casserole dishes. So for those of you who are like, what the F is a sostenuto pedal, I invite you to enjoy this wonderful demo done by somebody other than me. So what does the sostenuto pedal do? Well, uh, whereas the right hand pedal, the sustain pedal, lives all the dampers off so that if you play a chord, it sustains the whole lot. And if you play another chord, it gets a bit mushy unless you take it off and put it back down together, down again. Now the sostenuto, if you play the notes and then hold the, push the sostenuto pedal down, it holds those ones only. And the other ones you can play. And it doesn't go mushy because it cuts those ones off and holds those ones up. 
Now, if we look inside the piano, we can see what's actually happening. That's the normal sustain, lifting all the dampers up together. And the sostenuto, that's a little bar there. Now, if we lift some of them up and lift the bar up, it holds them up. So let's look at that again. Lift them up, press the bar, it holds them up. Let's just do one. Lift it up, press the bar, it holds it up. It's got this little piece of felt here uh, that uh, comes above the bar and holds it up. So who invented the sostenuto pedal? The question is often asked and various answers are given. Some say Albert Steinway invented it, citing his 1874-1875 patents, while others give credit to the French piano maker Claude Montal, known also for his textbook on piano tuning and repair, and for pioneering the idea that piano tuning and repair can be a good profession for the blind. He was blind himself and initiated the first training program for the blind in the 1830s in Paris. Those are the two most commonly cited, but in fact, neither one of them invented that third pedal in the middle that hardly anyone uses, but that seems to be a requirement for every self-respecting grand piano. The credit, or blame, depending on your point of view, for the invention of the sostenuto pedal actually belongs to the Boisselot brothers, piano makers from Marseille in southern France. It was a time of constant experimentation and change in the world of pianos, when the square piano began to be displaced by the upright, and the action of the grand was transformed from a simple jack attached to each key to the double escapement action in use today. The Boisselot brothers received their patent for their version of the sostenuto pedal in 1843 or 1844. This wasn't their only patent of that time. They also patented a different pedal that received more attention, at least initially. This particular pedal allowed one to play octaves by pressing just one key, making it possible for amateurs to imitate the passage work in octaves of the virtuosi of the time. Both the octave pedal and the sostenuto were displayed at the Paris Exposition of 1844. A reporter wrote about them in detail in the June 30th, 1844 edition of Revue et Gazette Musicale de Paris, a weekly newspaper covering everything having to do with music, including the latest concerts by Liszt. The reporter described with enthusiasm the possibilities of both pedals. However, he thought that what we now know as the sostenuto pedal, there called à son soutenu à volonté, sustaining tones at will, was more promising musically. He said that it would hold one or many dampers up as long as the pedal was depressed, while the other dampers functioned as usual. It's unclear from the description exactly how the mechanism was designed, an escapement lever and rocker are mentioned as holding the individual dampers up. But the reporter says he was astonished to see such a simple mechanism serve so useful a function, and he wondered why nobody had come up with it sooner. It seems that neither of these pedals were pursued for very long by the Boisselot, and they appear to have abandoned the Sostenuto patent as it was necessary to pay an annual fee in France to keep a patent current and in effect. In 1855, however, Claude Montal exhibited pianos, both grand and upright, with a pedal à son prolongé, his own variant on the Boisselot's term, described as having precisely the same function. His biography, published in 1857, states that he had first executed this pedal in 1844 and had later improved it. He had also exhibited pianos at the 1844 exposition in Paris, and no doubt he saw and heard about the pianos of the Boisselot. Montal died in 1865, and the French version of the Sostenuto pedal seems to have died with him. We come now to the probable reinvention of this same principle in the United States in 1874. There seems to be no reason to suppose that the American inventors were at all aware of the European precedents. The evidence is by no means complete, but there is enough of it, principally from the diary of William Steinway, to extrapolate a fairly convincing narrative. On May 9, 1874, an inventor by the name of M. Waldo Hanchett of Syracuse, New York, filed a patent application for a, quote, improvement in pianoforte attachments. He received patent 153766 for this invention on August 4, 1874. He proposed to call his invention a sostenuto pedal, apparently the first use of this name. William Steinway sent word to his older brother Theodore in Germany of this promising new invention. 
About a week later, Theodore sent a patent design for such a sostenuto pedal. This design seems to have needed some tweaking, so Albert worked on it for a few days, and they then took it to their patent attorney for vetting. The Steinways filed for a patent on October 15, 1874, and received patent number 156388 in less than two weeks on October 27th. Hanschitz's application, on the other hand, was approved three months after filing. It seems Steinway had clout for expedited service in the patent office, and it seems obvious that there was no thorough search of prior patents, or surely Hanschitz would have been found. William Steinway then went to young Hanschitz to show him that the Steinways had no need of his father's patent. It's unclear whether Steinway knew that Hanschitz had obtained a patent for his invention. The Hanschitz naturally filed a protest and a subsequent lawsuit. In the process of defending themselves, the Steinways found previous designs of the Sostenuto pedal and also learned of Montal's exhibits. The existence of the two earlier designs showed that Hanschitz had not, in fact, been the original inventor of the Sostenuto pedal, undercutting his patent claim. Meanwhile, Albert Steinway had been busy making improvements on his design. On May 15, 1875, he filed for three patents for grand, upright, and square pianos, which were approved on June 1st. The current designs for grand and upright actions are little changed from those patents filed in 1875. Steinway proceeded to include this pedal in all of their grand pianos, and since their pianos were so successful on the concert stage, that option became a norm rather than simply a curiosity. And hence, composers began to take advantage of it in their compositions, Claude Debussy being one of the most important early users. Still, the number of composers and compositions needing this pedal was not overly significant, and most piano makers didn't bother to include it. Broadwood, Bechstein, and Bösendorfer are some of the prominent makers who ignored the middle pedal in the late 19th and early 20th century, and prominent large volume makers like Yamaha only made it standard for their grand pianos in the late 20th century. It is clear that Steinway is responsible for the fact that most grand pianos today include a sostenuto pedal. So there you have it. The answer to the what, the why, and the how of that largely unwanted and unloved middle pedal on your piano now occupies valuable space in your brain. You're welcome. Special thanks again to Fred Schaefer Sturm for allowing me to use his research and his article for this video. Also, as usual, thank you to my patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to join them, please visit patreon.com slash the amateur. Subscribe to my YouTube channel and like The Amateur Piano on Facebook in order to get notifications for new episodes. I'm busily memorizing and writing episode 7 of the BEPS project, so stay tuned. <laughs>